Hi there, welcome to my latest video. Well, on this one, I'm going to discuss an important topic, something that uh, probably has crushed your mind already, and that's power over Ethernet. What does it mean? What is it used for? How can you take advantage of it? Well, I'm going to cover that topic in considerable detail in this video. If you stick around towards the end, you'll actually see some of it in action. Let me get started and uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, let me start off by going through a quick presentation talking about the history of power over Ethernet. Well, as shown here on the top slide bullet, power over Ethernet was originally devised by Cisco as a way of sort of revolutionizing and also solving certain needs that some of their customers had in terms of not having to run an extra power cable out to certain equipment, especially small equipment that didn't draw like a lot of power associated with it. So what they came up with was the idea of using unused wires in the regular Ethernet cable. The original 100 megabit Ethernet, it was only using four of the eight wires. Well, that has changed since, but I'll show you how they worked around that. But originally they just used the additional four wires that were not being used to generate a small amount of power that was sent out to certain devices that, for example, you know, video cameras, parts of security systems and things like that, which there was a high demand for back then obviously with the situation that uh, uh, developed shortly after that. Well, in 2003, they actually came up with an international standard from IEEE, and it followed pretty much what Cisco had developed for their first routers. They renamed it a little bit, whereas Cisco called it, as shown in the previous bullet, Cisco Inline Power. They now refer to it as Power Over Ethernet. Initially, they didn't call it Type 1, but just like with USB standards, once they started developing newer versions of it, then they basically renamed the older one as Type 1, you know, just to let you know. Then in 2009 came the first real development in the area of power over Ethernet. They actually went up to a decent amount of wattage. In 2003, it only supported just over 15 watts of power, which couldn't drive too much. It couldn't drive, for example, another switch that happened to be connected to the same network, a small switch, sort of a, a leaf switch that was out there. Well, with 30 watts, they could do that, and they didn't have to run power to it, especially if it was something that was quite remote. For example, you wanted to have Ethernet um, out at your you know, external building, and let's say you had a large farm and you had, let's say, a modern barn that you wanted to get Ethernet into it. Well, they were able to do that by throwing a small switch out there, and this new 2009 version could actually power that one. And it was referred to as Type 2. Also, if you look at the designations of the IEEE standard, the very first one they came up with in 2003, they called it the AF standard, 802.3 AF. And you'll see a lot of notation about it referenced in that regard. Whereas when they came up with the newer version of it, which was uh, Type 2, higher wattage primarily, it was called 802.3 AT. Then there was a major overhaul of the standard in 2018. And what they did then is they called it 802.3 BT. I guess it means something between going from A to now B. And it was able to come out with two different types. So they gave two subtypes in the same standard, the same standard write-up and the specifications for it. The first one was type 3 and the second one was type 4. Now today you may hear them more commonly referred to as PoE plus or PoE plus plus. And with those, you get even further expansions in the area of wattage that you could support. For example, the PoE Plus could handle up to 60 watts of power, and the PoE Plus Plus could theoretically reach up to 100 watts. However, there's an important distinction here. What determines how much power can actually be delivered is the length of the cable. Just like speed is affected with Ethernet, depending on how far the cable goes, Obviously, you start making it too long, you're going to start having more errors on the cable, and it will then slow down accordingly. The same thing holds true with the power. The cable itself has what we refer to in electrical engineering as resistance, over distance. Now, here's an example of a configuration where you decide you want to put, let's say, a security camera, and you have uh, the standard non-power over Ethernet connection to it. Well, you're going to have a switch. In this case, I put up here a TP-Link 
non-PoE switch, a standard one, just like the one that I currently have in my network that I'm being, I'll be replacing soon. And uh, it itself obviously is plugged in. It generates the signal power that goes across the Ethernet. Now I've indicated Cat5 here because Cat5 is pretty much the minimum for the current versions of PoE, whether that's PoE, PoE Plus, or PoE Plus Plus. Cat5 is pretty much the minimum. You could get away with Cat3, but I don't recommend it. It would have to be extremely short distances for that to work properly. So let's say that you have one of the ports on your switch connected up to the camera. Now, in addition to the data connection through the Ethernet, you would also have to provide power to that camera. You could use a 12 volt power supply, commonly referred to as a brick, that is plugged in separately, usually somewhere closer to the camera than the switch might be. Now let's see how this changes with power over Ethernet. Well, it's a different switch. I've put in here an actual Ubiquiti switch that has power over Ethernet. It's hard to tell by this picture, but all of those ports on that switch, which is my future switch, by the way, that I didn't show yet, is all power over Ethernet in addition to the signal capability that they all have. Oh, obviously, it is plugged in and it has the power to do that. But all it needs to power and get the signal from that camera is a single wire. That single Cat5 internet will allow you to both power and exchange data with that camera. Now, there are other ways of doing it. You could actually put what's called a power over ethernet injector. I happen to have one right here. Let me show it to you on the table so you can get a look at it. So right here, I actually have two examples of it. This one is a single port. You connect up the cable coming from your switch to one of these. They're actually labeled, one is, one is labeled power over ethernet and the other one is labeled LAN. So this one's labeled LAN and this one's labeled power over ethernet. You then have to plug this in and this is good for supplying power to one single port. This one here is a different case. This one can handle up to eight ports. Now, it also has a power connector on it here. You have to give it 12 volts. Uh, I think the actual designation here said it has to be at least 55 watts, or let's say about you know four amps worth of power in order to give the power onto the cable. So what you happen is you plug all of the LANs, one through eight here, and then you plug the power over ethernet, or what goes to the device that you want to drive to these. It will allow the signal to pass through it without any degradation, but it will also inject the power onto each of the ports that you use. Now, one disadvantage of this one, it's a low cost one. If you use this, you can only support speeds on your ethernet up to 100 meg. They also sell more expensive versions of these that can go up to one gig. And there's even some that are better than that. But in addition to that, one that I don't have is a rack mounted power over ethernet injector. And with that one, you have 16 ports. The top ports are connected where the initial uh, switch would be connected to. So you put it in a rack and you put little jumper cables or through a distribution panel. And then the bottom one is the one that'll go to the device that's being driven for both data and power. This gets into the detailed specifications. I've indicated the three main types of power over ethernet in each of the columns, PoE, PoE plus, and PoE plus plus, which itself is divided into two subtypes. And then I've indicated all of the different specifics about each of those three different standards. For example, what is the IEEE standard designation for it in the year it was introduced? The PoE type, as I've already mentioned. We also have the maximum power. Now you'll see two numbers on these. And what that refers to is what's coming out of the PoE injector or the switch and what in reality can be drawn by the device. Now, obviously, that's an estimated number. For example, for the 15.4, I have 1295. That's assuming a standard length of about 100 feet of Ethernet cable. If it's less than that, you will get more. If it's longer than that, you will get less. And then these are the voltages that are actually being driven by the injector across the wire. Notice they all end in 57 volts, but the original PoE version, the Type 1, it was at a lower initial voltage. And if you go all the way to the PoE++, it's actually the highest initial voltage that's coming out of the switch or the injector. 
Then I also have listed here the maximum power to the device again, as I had indicated above, and the voltage range to the device. So this is what the device will actually realistically see at the other end in terms of actual voltage. And that basically matches the wattage that we were just mentioning. And then we talk in the bottom section here, what type of cable and how much of the cable is being used to generate the power. In the case of the PoE and PoE Plus, it's only using two pair. Now, keep in mind, an Ethernet cable, as I've shown in previous videos, has four twisted pairs to it. So two of those are being used, and I'll show that in a moment in much more detail. When you go into the PoE++ though, that's when it's using all four pairs in order to generate the amount of current that equals the actual wattage that it can deliver to the devices. Down at the bottom, Basically, CAT5 will work with them all. Some of the original PoE, would, like I said earlier, would run with CAT3, but I don't recommend it. CAT3 has too many other limitations to it. But when you get into the PoE++, you should really go for CAT6 or better. It's preferred. Let's get into a little more detail. What are the advantages? A single low voltage cable is used to install a device. So you're running a new camera or a new device or a Raspberry Pi that you're putting remotely. All you have to do is run a single cable to it, which is the Ethernet cable. You don't need power bricks and or electricians to bring power in. Let's say you do have that barn situation that I mentioned earlier. Well, you would have to get an electrician to at least put power there. Well, it all depends on how you do it, obviously. Uh, let me show you now an example of a special case for the remote building. Let's say you're in a rural area. This is a device that I have not done a review yet on, but I wanted to show it in this video as an example of PoE. It has the ability to either have power delivered to it directly with a power brick, or the preferred way is through power over Ethernet. So you can do it either way on this device. This single one that I showed earlier, well, these came with this. This is a set of two of these and they each have their own power over ethernet injector. You would still need electrical power though in order to use this. There's actually two of these just to give you a, head, a heads up on my future video and you can separate them by up to about a half a mile and it will generate the signal going across a direct line of sight. You can't put too many objects in the middle, you know, not even heavy trees in order for the signal to get from this one to its sister or matching device at the other end. Another advantage would be reduced electrical shock hazard. The voltages that are in power over ethernet are not enough to hurt the average adult person. With a managed PoE switch, this is a big advantage, and you'll see that when I deploy my new switch not too long in the future, you can actually remotely turn power on and off of a device. Remotely connect to the switch itself, well, you can control on a managed switch that is also power over Ethernet, at least any one that's uh, you know, made in the last few years, you can actually cause the power over Ethernet to be either turned on or off, or even controlled it even more distinctly than that, depending on the switch. Also, with a managed PoE switch, backup power is only needed for the switch. You do not need backup power at the remote end where the device is, since the switch is providing the power over the ethernet cable, the only one you'll have to give backup power to, you know, let's say a battery backup or something equivalent, would be at the switch itself. Finally, additional PoE devices can be deployed much more quickly to an existing set of ethernet wiring. So if you have something similar to what I have, wiring all over the place that I'm currently not using to drive PoE devices, Basically, at a turn of a switch, all of my cabling is at least CAT5. And as long as the device at that end doesn't need speeds beyond what CAT5 supports, once I have the new switch in place, I can just connect a new device at the other end that requires power over Ethernet, and we're ready to go. Here are some examples of the different types of PoE and what they're best used for. For example, the original spec PoE, it's meant for small devices that are going to, again, draw like, you know, less than uh, a dozen watts of power. Things like uh, access points, small access points, not large ones, and voice over IP phones, they will work fine with that. That's originally what it was designed for by Cisco, for devices like this. The PoE Plus, now you jump up. Now you can have 
cameras that are fully featured, including the ability to do pan, tilt, zoom, which means they have motors in them in addition to the electronics. You could stick a regular non-motorized camera, dumb camera at the other end using PoE, but if you want a smart camera and one that has these additional features, PoE Plus is the way to go. You can put uh, video iPhones at the other end of it. And then finally, when you get to PoE++, these are just a couple of examples. You can also power pretty large switches with PoE++ in addition to things like a laptop, maybe even some of the smaller all-in-one computers, the future ones that are going to be PoE++ compliant, and even small TV sets. Let's talk a little bit now about the wiring. I'm going to get a little bit technical here. So, you know, just be ready for that. You could always zoom ahead, but those of you who might be interested in how this is wiring, I'm going to go through it in a considerable amount of detail here. Let's start with the two pair version, types one and type two. Well, here's an example of an ethernet cable with four pairs or a total of eight wires. Generally up to this point, before PoE existed, we were using this just to drive data back and forth. With PoE, what we need to do is at the source end on the left here, we have to put power. Now this could be batteries or it could be a switch, it could be any number of them. This is the universal symbol for a power generating DC power because you see plus and minus on it. So it's not AC and it's generally lower voltages. So you need that at the source end and at the destination end you have to have the components to extract that DC power from the actual uh, Ethernet cable. The primary thing is what we call a bridge rectifier, which will take the power off the two center taps of transformers, because on the left-hand side, the power was injected into center taps of small transformers, and you do the opposite at the receiving end. But in addition to that, you need some additional power filtering. So a separate device here, which I won't get into the circuitry on that one, that gets much more complex. It will basically clean up that power, maybe adjust the voltage a little bit, so that you can deliver it to the actual device. Now let's talk about the four pair version, types three and four. Well, you still have all of what we had in terms of handling this configuration for the two pair. But in addition to that, we have to replicate that to some degree. We go ahead and put in the same type of logic and circuitry on the remaining two pair and also on both the source and destination of that two pair. They can go through the same filtering device at the receiving end without any problem. That just has to be beefed up a little bit, but the, the actual uh, circuitry there is pretty similar. And they did this because you want to be able to have backward compatibility. So you could actually use this four pair one if you only have two pair at the other end. So there you have it, power over ethernet. Devices like this and future devices that we haven't even dreamed of are going to use it. And you should take advantage of it if you decide to upgrade your network in any way. You don't have to buy a switch that handles all the ports of power or Ethernet. You can actually buy some that handle just a few of the ports. And you can use those ports for the devices that you want to add to your network that require power over Ethernet. I'll put up a picture of one example here right now of a cheaper version of one that you might want to look at. So hopefully you got something out of this video, and until the next time, take care.